Hello, live stream. Uh, we will be starting in about five minutes. Once again, we will be starting in about five minutes. Are we good? All right. Um, welcome everybody to uh, um, tonight's uh, sort of pre Great Lakes Poetry Festival event, but still part of the Great Lakes Poetry Festival. Um, my name is Marty Ackett, and I'm the Adult Programming Coordinator for Peter White Public Library. I'm also um, one of the people who have organized the Great Lakes Poetry Festival. Um, I'm really excited. Um, you know, everybody says December is the most wonderful time of the year. I think April is the most wonderful time of the year because it's National Poetry Month. Um, I have a couple 
Well, a few groups that I need to thank. Um, one is the Library of Michigan, who um, are one of our sponsors for the Great Lakes Poetry Festival. Also, Northern Michigan University is one of our sponsors for the Great Lakes Poetry Festival, the UP Poet Laureate Foundation, and the Marquette Poet Circle, as well as the Friends of Peter White Public Library. And uh, speaking of the Friends, they are also um, the group that pays for all of our live streaming equipment. So if you are watching this on YouTube, YouTube. We still have plenty of seats here. You can come. But um, thank the friends of Peter White Public Library because um, you wouldn't be able to watch it on YouTube if it weren't for them. Um, so we've got a couple things that I'm going to highlight. Um, obviously, next week is the, the big kickoff on Sunday for the Poetry Festival. But there's a few things coming up this week that I want to make you aware of besides this wonderful poetry reading by um, Josh Brindle or J.J. Brinsky. Which one do you prefer, Josh or J.J.? Oh, he said I can call him whatever. Wow. <laughs> I'll, I'll, go, I'll go with JJ then, if that's what you prefer. So we have this wonderful poetry reading tonight. Um, and then next week, if I, I mean on Thursday, which I really want to highlight if I can find it. See, there's so much going on. Um, just a second. Um, where is it? Don't tell me they left it off this. I saw it. Um, anyway, um, on... Um, Thursday night, starting at 6.15 p.m. It start, the, the program itself starts at 6.30, but um, we're going to have the Teal Lake Drum Circle here um, on uh, Thursday night at 6.15 to, sort of, um, to sort of kick off the event. But Thursday night, we have um, uh, uh, an archaeologist, someone who's worked um, on a specific site for where um, they discovered um, a settlement for the indigenous people. Um, and he's, his name is Jim Paquette. And, um, we are um, co-sponsoring an event with the Sault Ste. Marie Tribe No. 5. Um, he's going to be doing a presentation about that um, archaeological dig. And also, we have the uh, Teal Lake Drum Circle here as uh, well on, um, uh, on Thursday night. So really, it's going to be a special night. If you've never had an opportunity to um, hear a drum circle live, um, it's incredible. It's powerful. So I really encourage you to show up. And then um, Jim Paquette is such a wonderful, wonderful presenter. So um, please come here on um, Thursday night. Starting, I would get here early. The program itself starts at 6.30, but the drum circle is going to start playing at about 6.15. Um, and then on Friday, we have our global cinema, and the film this Friday, starting at noon, is Farewell, My Concubine, um, which has been voted by um, uh, uh, Time Magazine as one of the 100 best films in global history. Um, and if you've never seen Farewell, My Concubine, um, I really encourage you to um, come to that. Um, and then I'll just highlight two things um, from the Great Lakes Poetry Festival. I Because if I went through everything... I would be the reader, and Josh would just come up and say, thank you very much, come and buy my books. Um, so um, uh, I want to uh, highlight on um, Sunday, on Sunday from 1 to 4 at Provisions Marquette is going to be the kickoff event for the Great Lakes Poetry Festival. Um, we have um, Beverly Mathern, um, Gayla Malaire, both of them are here. Um, at Troy Graham is going to be reading, and I might read a few poems. And then we also have Lillian Presno, who's going to be doing a concert that day. Um, and then Monday night, um, Diane Glancy, our headline poet, is going to be here to read at 7 p.m. right here in the, um, in the community room. So lots of other great stuff. If you have not picked up a brochure, um, I encourage you to do that and write all of these things on your calendar so you don't miss a thing. Um, anyway, um, I want to um, say just a few things about Josh, um, typewriter god, poet, artist, um, just all around great, great person. Um, he did a program here uh, a little while ago, um, typewritery. He had typewriters all through the um, library, and, and people were like typing lines of poetry and quotations. It was really wonderful. Um, and this is his first book. Um, that he funded through a Kickstarter campaign while the morning stars sang together. Um, I, uh, this is the first time I've had it in my hands. I'm, I'm not going to let this one go. I'm going to buy this one and take it home and read it. Um, Josh, uh, JJ, Josh, JJ, whatever, um, went to, when I was at Southern Indiana, 
Southern Indiana University, where he got a BA in creative writing. Um, and um, he has just been a presence. Um, uh, I, you know, I met Josh about a year, a year and a half ago or something like that. And he has just been a presence uh, for poetry, a spokesperson for poetry and art. Um, uh, every time I see him, he's so exciting um, to talk about all the things that he has going on. So please give a great Lakes Poetry Festival welcome to Josh Brindle, J.J. Brinsky. <laughs> It's a lot, a lot of real estate. Thanks, everybody, for coming. Uh, this is uh, this is really fun. Um, I've just spent uh, over a month working on a Kickstarter, and now I'm on the back end of a Kickstarter, getting ready to ship out uh, 140, 50 books or so. And uh, it was it was a really fun way to crowdfund and get a book uh, to the point where I could print it and pay for the artwork. And uh, I had a really good friend. If you look at the cover of this uh, book when you get a chance. Uh, that is an actual painting. Uh, it's, um, I believe it's 11 by 17 on black canvas, acrylic paint. Um, he's a really, really good illustrator and a writer himself, but uh, excels at, uh, at painting. So that was a friend of mine named Jamin Still from Kansas. So I got to work with a number of really good friends. I, I'm, I'm a part of a couple of online writing communities, one out of Nashville called The Rabbit Room, and another one, um, a smaller one uh, called Flash Fiction Magic. And I started getting into this. Uh, if you ask me whether some of my poems are short, are very short stories or my short stories meld into poems, the answer is just yes, I think. Um, so you'll, you'll find in this collection, I'm going to read a couple of very short stories. Um, and I think that's the way that I like to leave them. I like writing um, little flash fiction pieces. I usually, I, I have put myself to writing at least a story a week, I usually on Fridays, and I try to be able to fit it in the caption of an Instagram post. That's usually like two or three hundred words. Um, I've, there are a few longer stories in here, so you're going to find that. But um, so, so this is uh, my jump into poetry and into um, into storytelling in, in the way I love it. And it, it, if you've known me any point in my life, and if you read the introduction to this, it basically uh, really captivates, uh, it really encapsulates who I, who I am and who I have been since I was about six years old. And that is somebody who just absolutely is in love with space and the stars, the galaxies, the thought of there being planets that might have some kind of creatures or people or civilizations or something on them. Um, I even like to think of just like, you know, the piles of diamonds that are sitting somewhere so far from here, we can barely, you know, think, think of it, you know, the, the, the things that are out there that are beyond us and how huge, just absolutely gargantuan, colossal, every big word you can think of um, that is this universe that we, that we are in. And, and yet we're on this fast spinning ball that sustains life. And here we all are. And I get to read you guys some words about that tonight. So um, this is really exciting for me. And thank you for coming. Thank you that I could share this. Um, this, this is an amalgam of theology, philosophy, astronomy, and just fun with words. Um, I think at the end of the day, uh, I might not be the best linguist, definitely not the best grammaticist. Is that even a word? See, I make up words when I want to. And um, that's, you'll find that in, in, this, uh, in this collection. Um, but I do, I do just like to play with words. Um, I think a lot of times, like, painters can paint and play with their colors, play with their paints, as a sculptor would, you know, or a, um, a potter would play with clay. I, that's kind of how I see words. I see them in shapes. I like to form them. I like to get them somewhere and, and, and move them around until it looks cool. <laughs> and so um, there is very much a younger me in, in this. And you will find, I think some of this is even, I've, every time I think that you bring work to someone, and I've started working on some of these poems two and a half, almost three years ago, and you bring work to people, you're like, well, my, my work right now is much more mature and gritty, and, you know, it's really serious, and it's, it has a lot of gravitas, and, you know, like, but this, this is the younger me. This, this paid an ode to the younger me, and the things that uh, offer me joy, levity, goodness, um, enthrall. 
So, uh, so that's what I'm bringing to you guys tonight. Uh, I don't want to bore you too many of the details, but uh, I'll give you a little bit of background here and there, but I just wanted to read a few things to you. And if you're here to listen, I appreciate that. Um, and I will throw in a couple of those flash stories as well. Uh, definitely this whole collection ties together with the basic theme of space. There's even some sci-fi that I've thrown in there, some of its fictional stuff that I've, that I've been uh, creating, a uh, fictional... Uh, universe that I've been building. And uh, it's, yeah, it's really, it's really been fun. So I'm going to start off, if you have your, your, your books with you, uh, if you happen to, happen to grab one, I'm going to be on page 25 on the very first poem. And this poem is called Expander. Crack the cosmos, pour out of starish mist, explode through all the vapors and colors of glory the death and rebirth of suns, the spinning of spheres. Oh, greet me in the morning with galaxies in your eyes, maker of vast collections, of holy displays, of fluorescent viewscapes. Oh, wreck my retinas for beauty. Oh, clobber me whole. Cleave my mind afresh, pour in your platinum, liquefied jewels, solder with silver seam, glue with gold load. Open up this head like a Comet carved cloud canyon and fill, overflow, expand, O oh, expander of worlds. That's the end of that one. Thank you. And the next two will be a couple of the uh, next one is a very short story, and then we'll I'll, I'll read you just a another one after that. Um, This may or may not be in a fictional universe. It's called Unmanned. It's so quiet, he thought internally, or maybe said in a sub-whisper. He could not quite tell the difference. I guess space has no soundtrack save the loop of words spinning, flashing in your head. Star stuff streaked by his slow craft drifting, no sphere in sight out here, passing beyond the arc of nine. The end of all star clouds is shatteringly silent, but a symphony for the eyes. He took a breath, no fog on glass. Ahead of his thoughts, way out here, the swirlish swirlish curling of stars occurs, towering up like a light-speckled wave that would never crash, suspended. I bet they would have music for this, a soundtrack, a poetry, digital images of his programmers, shot up on the cockpit glass, his gears and wires warmed, his CPU word to life. Images were sent home. Um, I got a fun story for this one. So this, this story actually has two more parts now. I thought this character might die rather suddenly after I wrote this story, but then I've found her alive and well floating, uh, interstellar out of our solar system. Um, I'm going to dedicate this one to Tom off France, who uh, I believe may have helped us with the, uh, vo- was it the Voyager or Voyager 2? Yeah. Uh, had a little part on both of the Voyagers. Little, little part on both of the Voyagers. We have someone with us who had a little part on one of those Voyagers, which I think one is still careening. Uh, yeah, they're, they're both still careening. Yeah. Yes, yeah. <laughs> Um, so I think that's really fantastic, and this really does play into that. So, Tom, I hope you enjoy this. This also has a very particular uh, name. There's actually another obscure family name in here, but I named this after my grandmother. Um, her first name is not Loretta, but the, her, the name of the character is Loretta Louise Powers, and my grandmother was named Louise Powers, and I don't know why I tried to make her a tiny astronaut, but I did. Um, so this is called The Tiniest Astronaut. Loretta Louise Powers was the tiniest astronaut ever fired into space, unbeknownst to nearly everyone on Earth. When someone is less than an eighth of an inch tall, strapped to two full-size oxygen tanks inside of a life pod not much bigger than an Altoids 10, it is very easy to go unnoticed. After she shrunk herself in a bad engineering experiment at MIT, her job prospects were a bit slim. To make things worse, they brought her to NASA in a quite quite poorly furnished matchbox, uh, which is always insulting for a PhD. And somehow, the four top-secret, high-clearance bozos who ran the spacecraft program were able to talk Loretta Louise into it, 
after a quarter thimble of whiskey, of course. But now Dr. Shotsky had died in a car accident, Captain Carlson disappeared after retirement, and Holly Hetty got a job in Hollywood, and the last one monitoring her communication was suffering from dementia, as far as anyone could tell, and hadn't responded to her in two years, four months, and 13 days. Thanks for nothing, Gilbert. Several years back, she had left the solar system full interstellar. She had been closer to Jupiter, Saturn, Neptune, and Uranus <coughs> cough, uh, than any living soul. Uh, that cough is actually in the text. Um, than any living soul, and no one knew. She had eaten a record-breaking amount of dehydrated micro food, slurped more tang than a full-sized seven-year-old, and all this without one TV appearance involving squeeze cheese floating in zero gravity or an embarrassing explanation of recycling her own urine. But the things her tiny eyes had seen through the two-by-two-inch viewing window, vast, alien, stellar landscapes and streaks of light to melt the mind and reform it into praise for its origin. It was, not, it was now just before her 70th birthday in radio silence, and Loretta Louise was sick to death of the 18 shrunken books she had had and the stupid tiny card deck for solitaire she'd almost worn blank. But instead of feeling further from everything, she felt closer to something. And maybe someday someone would find her logs and observations as backtracks on the Voyager's radio messages, and she'd get a small town Midwestern gym named after her. And that's it. Um, all right. So I forget the name of this form, but when you're actually, um, a, a lot of the, a lot of the uh, poetry, uh, specifically the smaller, shorter poetry in this collection, you'll see is it kind of formatted uh, purposely. There, there's some fun shapes that I, that I used in here. And my formatter, my friend Andrea, who lives up in Saskatchewan, um, she did a great job of like kind of uh, highlighting uh, what poetry can be when it's in the right shape. Uh, I, I read just enough E. e. Cummings and a, and a few others like him in college to be dangerous with shaping my poems weirdly. And so I, I, I felt that this, this really, um, this form, and I, again, somebody, Beverly, you might, you might know this, but it's, you, you, you spell out a sentence uh, by the last word of every line. And I cannot remember, I, I should have looked it up beforehand. Uh, I wasn't sure if I was going to read this or not. But this piece is called A Jealousy of Angels. And if you see it in type, um, I'll read the, the sentence that makes up the end of, of every line here. Have not I gazed on to see space beyond the spaces where I dwell, stars strewn, nebulous, swirling? I think only of astro angels. I hear them bragging and telling tales, the sailors on black seas swagger rolling through galaxies where supernovas thunder. And if you look at that, it says, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder. And that's just a, just a great lyric that some of you might notice, yeah. Um, I think I've just got a couple more here that I wanted to go through. Uh, this is a fun one. Um, this, I had to put something in here about Star Wars. If you know me, I just can't stop talking about Star Wars. How you doing, Phil? Thanks for coming. Um, but, uh, this is on page 75 and, uh, it's called, It Was Star Wars. I really think it was Star Wars, Return of the Jedi in the Strand Theater at age six with my dad to be exact. And later wearing out the whole trilogy on VHS with my brother, Matthew, then light speeding through stretching stars, zipping in the falcon from Tatooine to Hoth, laser swords and alien races, some furry, some wookie, some lizard wearing, heli uh, we wearing yellow, bosk, uh, some green wearing orange, Greedo, who was tragically fried. Everything far, far away in a galaxy, a broad universe big enough for my imagination. I'm sure of it now. It was Han and his space freighter and his friendship with Luke. It was a Skywalker story, a religion of Jedi space heroes that baptized me into sci-fi 
and gave birth to Star Wonder. I kind of think that the second half of this book is the weirder half. Um, and again, a couple of those pieces you could tell, I, they definitely come from a very young, this is the vulnerability, again, of, of this, is like sharing things that you're like, I think I've written things that are more mature than this, that are grittier, that are gutsier than this. And then some of these just pop out, and I'm like, man, but that brought such joy. And I think that it's so good when we create, and it just brings joy. It is good. Such, such great, great, uh, just a great thing to be able to say when you get done with something and say, that's pretty good. That's good. I like that. Um, this one's from Marquette, so an ode to where we live. Uh, so I think it's the only mention of anything locally terrestrial in this, uh, in this book. Uh, this is called a solstice poem, uh, parentheses, Marquette, Michigan at dusk. And this was written sitting in the parking lot next to Lower Harbor where the, um, uh, the little playground uh, I think they've, uh, you know, covered that up with dirt now. Um, but uh, it, I was sitting right there, and I was looking at the ore dock, and it was, it was either the day before solstice or the day of solstice, winter solstice. So here goes, a solstice poem. Lights, snow, bright moon, Venus, visible Venus and crisp air, Marquette, the ore dock. The sun has fallen asleep. The clamor subsides, and I am fully awake in the dusky dying of the year. Solstice, winter, arrival. Come heaven to this frozen shoreline town, to these dimming days unlit. Thank you. How are we doing on time? Have I been up here for an hour and a half? I, either in my head, like, okay, so with like adult ADHD, don't tell anybody this. Um, I'm telling everybody this. Um, but with all ADHD, this was, I was informed of this recently. There's a thing called time blindness. And, and yeah, I have that. So this is either six minutes or an hour and six minutes, and I don't know. So I can completely, completely lose track. Awesome. I'm going to take, I'm going to read two more short ones, I think, and that's going to be about it. Um, where I just had my space. And then I lost it. Uh, oh, yes. Uh, my favorite book on Earth... Eh, that's fun to say in this context. Uh, my, my favorite book on Earth is Paralandra by uh, C.S. Lewis. Uh, a lot of people have not read C.S. Lewis's adult fairy tales that he wrote. Uh, uh, they weren't near as popular as Narnia, uh, but they were called Out of the Silent Planet... Paralandra and That Hideous Strength. And a lot of people didn't finish That Hideous Strength, and you should, shame on you. Um, but uh, they're all very, very good. I have them on audiobook, and I usually listen to them once a year. Uh, that was my COVID prize to myself. I think my wife had bought one of them, and then I got the other two. But uh, this is uh, from, from an image of, uh, or from a character, really, uh, kind of showing her a little bit in this poem. Uh, if you remember the green lady from the, uh, you'll see her in the beginning of Paralandra when Ransom uh, lands on what we would say, uh, see as the, the um, planet Venus. And this is a poem about feeling like you can age years in just a few days, <laughs> depending on what your circumstances are. It's called, I was so young yesterday. I was so young yesterday, said the green lady. I too, with her, have grown old in a day, older still in two. An age has passed inside my body while the earth rotated merely 48 hours. What was my name on Thursday? How did children refer to this wizard's legend last week? It is but a fading ancestor's memory. A flitting dimness where a brilliant star once hung. Who was I before, and how did I exist in such ignorance when brain and heart pulsed like an infant's? Surely knowledge, and that humbly accepted, does age a woman, a man, in non-quantifiable ways, and mysterious internal gearings of change break all barriers of time, kissing the edges of the eternal."
And I think I'll end with this one. Um, this is something from also from our solar system. Um, this this piece uh, is on uh, page 121, for those of you who are still following along. Sorry, I'm not naming all the pages. But uh, this piece, there was a, a composite uh, picture that I believe someone at NASA or one of the adjacent um, space agencies had, had uh, compiled some pictures together. And it was uh, the moon's uh, Io and Europa, like, passing in front of just the open maw of Jupiter. And, and it gives you this idea of how colossal, how ominous <laughs> Jupiter is. And, and, I, and, I, and I really, that picture, this is, so this is basically an ekphrastic. Um, I wish I had that picture with me to show you. Uh, but th if, if you know what an ekphrastic is, that's usually a piece of poetry that describes a, a photo or a piece of art usually. Um, so I really, I just got this, I got this really ominous feeling of Jupiter. I was like, yeah, man, he's freaking scary sometimes, you know? So, so I, wanted to, I wanted to really highlight that in this poem. So this is called The Dragon and His Moons. Like Io and Europa stealing past the gas giant dragon with gaping red eye. Swirling fury and cloud in fogging angry smoke from colossal nostril. A hardly slumbering storm of a world swells like lungs, so slowly they creep. Sentry satellites submissive, frightened, or sorry, frightful witnesses in orbital slink. Churning, you can see Jupiter breathing to reach and swallow these sneaking moons whole. <laughs> That's it. Um, yeah. Any questions? <laughs> you supposed to do Q&A with this? Um, yeah, yeah. Any, any questions on anything I read? Um, I, I just, I've read, I was telling Marty earlier, I've read these poems so many times. I was just, I'm like, I'm just going to cruise through here and read the ones that catch my eye, the ones that I, that I love, which you kind of love all these in, in, its, in their own way um, when, you, when you write them. But you have to read them like 66 times before they're done. Um, go ahead, Mary. Do you remember your first poem that you ever wrote? Can you say it? Oh, no, I cannot. I remember, I remember where I was when I, 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 I wrote my first poem when I was, a, I believe, a freshman in high school. And I remember, man, if I can remember her name, I think it was her, her name was Mrs. Hallett. And she, I don't think she's with us anymore, but she... It was something about dark and light in a tunnel. You know, no, there's no poetry ever written about dark and darkness and light. But um, it, it was it was something dealing with with darkness and light in a tunnel. And and I was expressing some emotions. And I'm I'm, I'm a big feeler. I'm I'm an Enneagram four. I can talk your ear off. I'm a flaming extrovert. I, I help my introvert friends. I actually have like a ministry to introverts. You know, it's like, can I help you along? Do we need to go somewhere to talk to people? You know, um, so I don't really do that, but it does. I do kind of operate in that in that uh, place. But um, yeah, uh, she had uh, just pulled me aside and said, "You really have a way of expressing yourself in words. I think that you should do this more." Something to that effect. It was just very simple, and that something about that stuck with me uh, until I read uh, Ray Bradbury is my single favorite author on earth. For a lot of people, it's Tolkien or Austin or, or someone, but uh, Ray Bradbury is, he's my guy. And I read the Illustrated Man, uh, book of short stories, and he bridges on some of these. And there are obscure books of his poetry out there, and I own two of them, and his poetry is fantastic. It's mostly rhyming. It's very interesting. And you can tell the man has read everything on the planet. And, I mean, he goes into mythologies, and he's grabbing stuff from, you know, contemporary writers and Mary Shelley and Poe. And he I mean, just talks about Poe all the time. And, I mean, they're, they're, like, in the room with him, you know? And so I, I just got sent in that direction, and I kept wanting to articulate myself in these shorter pieces of writing and uh, I loved playing with words. I loved discovering new words. And that all just kind of, you know, my imagination, the 
expressing my emotions that just kind of all mixed together but yeah it was definitely freshman year I can if I could go back to my own high school I could tell you what room it was in but I don't other than it being about dark and light I think I might have written it on like a weird colored paper like peach or yellow or something um that's about all I remember but yeah that kid's talking yeah how you doing Yeah. You know, whole book, but yours definitely seems to. I was wondering what your approach is to publishing something like this. Did you try to publish individual pieces, or did you wait till you had the whole thing done before you wanted to present it? No, this is really. Um, I set myself to. Uh, that's a really good question, by the way. Um, I set myself to writing every day. Um, in my wife's got to head up. Bye, Grace. Thank you for coming. Um, uh, I set myself to writing every day the second or third month of the COVID lockdowns. And it, it just, I, I knew that I needed it to stay sane. Um, and I also needed it to express a lot of the big things that were going on at that time. And there was a lot of heartache and grief. And um, I was just discovering uh, grief and lament in my life. Um, so I just started writing a lot. And, and so to bridge into your question there, uh, I write what comes out every day. And then I start to slowly, when I start seeing themes poking out and I start seeing, um, you know, I've got like 10 poems about trees over here and I've got 18 poems about the Bible over here and I've got, you know, literary and poetry. And then I've got really weird, you know, creepy poetry over here. I'll start putting them in little collections. And this by far, I, I got to November of that uh, first year of the lockdowns and I did a poem a day challenge in November. And I'd say there's probably about 10 or 15 of those poems that made it in this collection. And I just, I was on a stick. I was, I was thinking about space a lot. I was looking at the stars, you know, things kind of slowed down enough to where I actually looked up for the first time in several years. And, uh, <laughs> So for me, it, 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 I, I keep writing what, what's coming out or what I'm thinking about, and I'll start to see some, some things forming. And, and also, when I started writing a lot of flash fiction, it was almost all sci-fi, and it was almost all in space. And so I started kind of putting some of those pieces together, and this was the number of these that were kind of ready to go when I started compiling this. So yeah, thanks for that question. That was, that was a really good one. Um, yeah, any, anybody else? Yes, Hannah? Oh, a style, like a style? Yeah, no, not, not really. I mean, I do write some haikus. Uh, I've written some tonkas, which is a l little bit longer. It kind of looks a little bit like a, a haiku, but it's a little bit longer. Um, I, I tend to write um, kind of linguistically and shape-wise, I, I take a lot from Hopkins. Um, he had a lot of springing. Uh, sp sprung rhyme, I believe is what he called it. And then he had some like kind of internal rhyming, lots of good, lots of sounds, lots of alliterations, lots of things that were kind of bouncing around on the inside of his poetry. And I definitely take from that. I didn't know I was taking from that. And then I started writing from uh, reading Hopkins more. And I was like, oh yeah, he's uh, that's, he's a lot better at that than I am. So, <laughs> so, but, but I do. So I'd say my favorite style of poem is one that sounds really fun. It sounds good. It sounds uh, lot, lots of, uh, flavorful words. Um, I definitely have gone way further in some of the directions of these poem poems that than what I've read tonight. Uh, but yeah, I I I tend to like poems that um, I, I've been challenged at times to write uh, word plays, like like just something that sounds what we would probably see as like Dr. Seuss. Um, but I like to, I'd like to get really complex with word play type poems, and I think those are at hand. If I could answer your question, those are probably my favorite to do. I don't do them all the time. They're wonderful. They can be absolutely exhausting. Um, cause a lot of times I'll be coming up with multiple rhymes in a row and multiple alliterations in a row and using really weird words and making up a lot of words inside of those. I didn't have any of those in here, but I've definitely written quite a few of them. So that is definitely my favorite. Uh, and I, but I have not written a ton of them, but hopefully at some point they'll be rolling off the tongue a little bit more off the tongue, off the pen, off the typewriter, whatever. Um, yeah. Thanks. For that. that was a good question. Yeah. Yes, Phil Britton. Um, what do you like about poetry as, a, as an art form of self-expression um, over, like, you know, narrative nonfiction? 
fiction or writing fiction or writing songs or painting? What really uh, resonates with you about poetry specifically? Economy. <laughs> Economy of space, time. And I don't mean that just as space and time like, like this, but like actually the time I have to write, I have four kids, uh, kind of two jobs now. My creative work has taken on a part-time job. I work at the sports rack. I got a few sports rack friends back here. Um, and then I, I so I'm, I'm in the bike world. I've got four kids. I've got a lot going on. It's a busy life right now, busy stage in life. And I find myself really gravitating to poetry because I, I think when we can find a way to be succinct and brief and yet say a lot with that brevity, um, I think poetry needs to be read slower because of that. I actually have a piece about how to read this book, and it contains an introductory poem about how we should read poetry slow and just kind of bounce it around the inside of our mouths and our heads, read it two or three times, read it a couple days in a row. I tell some of the people that uh, I'm in a writing group where I help some younger poets kind of try to find their voice and their style, and I said, you know, like, if you're reading poetry, which that's another thing, if you like poetry, you should read poetry. They told me that in college and I told them to get lost. And then, you know, 20 years later, I'm like, I, sh I should read more poetry if I actually want to write it. So I've been reading more poetry than any time in my life. And just finding the amount of substance that Dylan Thomas can talk about in one page. I, if you can get all of Dylan Thomas in one page in your mind, like it, it's, it's, it's like there's all these like pull down windows in, in poetry. You know, it's like you, you click on one word in poetry and then all this other stuff comes out. And so that's, that's kind of what I feel like it is. It's compact, it's powerful, it packs a punch, it's, it's, it's concise, but there's so much going on. And I think there's something about that. It's actually the size of poetry that I love. And I can get my thoughts out on my phone. I can get my thoughts out when I have 10 minutes to type on my typewriter. So I, I, I really, I like that. I like the economy of it. And that's why I write mostly with, with my fiction. I write mostly flash pieces. And I try to get a lot done in two or 300 words. I try to see if I can get an entire story arc, if I can get a couple characters in there, and if I can make something of goodness and substance happen. So I hope, does that kind of answer the question? Yeah, okay, cool. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. I, I find myself being very oddly at the end of the spectrums. You know, it, it's like, you know, atoms and, you know, atmosphere and, and, and outer space. You know, you, you have these like very, very tiny things. And I go into a little bit of that in a few of the poems in here where I kind of go from the microscopic to the absolutely, you know, huge. Um, uh, we don't use the word humongous enough anymore. I think I should bring that word back. But yeah, just there, there is something about that to me of being very small and writing about very big things. Um, what, what's that? It, it is, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, you know, you can travel a long way in w one page uh, if, if you do it well. Um, yeah, and I've, I've been reading, yeah, Dylan Thomas has been the one very specifically lately uh, but I'm trying to think of somebody who writes like even maybe shorter. W Wendell Berry. The guy can talk about a river for like, I'm going through his like Sabbath poems and he could talk about a river and, and a, and a couple, few trees for like pages and pages. You're like, I think he's talking about the same river. I think he's talking about the same trees. And, and he doesn't use extremely complex language either, but what he's saying I mean, can take up enough, and, and I, a lot of his poems are, I, you know, I don't know how many lines, but like that big on the page, you know? <laughs> so, but I can sit there with that in a morning and really, they're meditative, they're very inviting, they invite you into what he's seeing and where he's at. So, yeah, that's, I, I do love that, that you can go a long way. Um, so yeah, hopefully you get to go a long way, and it's, this isn't a very big book, it's not a lot of, a lot of words, but hopefully, I, I, I like to say, I hope the words are, are worth quite more than what they just seem to be on the page. So, uh, yeah, go ahead. Hey, I thought it was really um, refreshing earlier when you were talking about your, your younger man poems and your, your poems of gravity, you know? And yeah. I, I'm just wondering um, how you, how you um, engage um, with, with your earlier work. I think of, like, today's day and age, you know, like, today's headlines, tomorrow's, you know? Um, yep. 
And I think about like um, I mean, we had a lot of poets in here. Yeah. In several books. Yeah. You know? And how do you how do you stay um, a fan, stay in engagement with your earlier work, even if you are not that person anymore? Yeah. Well, you you honor the hell out of them, and and I I am. That's something that the art community and the creative community, I can be a little opinionated here, um, and even the poetry community, that we can always kind of say, that like, yeah, it's old hat. I've seen that type of thing before. I've done that. But for that creator, and, and I want to encourage, you know, artists and writers to be careful with this, but, like, to never just, like, burn the drawer of your old art, you know? I've heard people say that. Like, the, some of that stuff, just, you're just going to end up just burning it. And I'm like, you should never burn any of it. I think it's always that, that maybe it's not, you know, your best work, but um, I think that there's something that's very important about the stages of our work and what we learn from it. I mean, I mean I'm, I'm reading these tonight and I'm going, oh, yeah, I've written another poem that had like a line in there that would have been so much cooler to read. And you know, again, you could start judging it. You could start, you know, passing judgment on it. You could start, you know, kind of dismissing it and pushing it off to the side. And I think that we really have to honor the younger versions of us, the younger creators in us, the younger poets and writers, artists in us, because they're us. You know, I am the snowball. And, and right now, I mean, I'm preparing for all of the work I will ever do right now. You know, all the work I will do continuing from here, I'm, I'm preparing for that right now. That's why I'm doing this, because I'm going to create more. And that, so that, that work that I did before this, in this collection, and the two and three years since I've written a lot of this material, I, it, it's, it's, it's getting me down the road, but it's all important. You know, it, it's, it's because I couldn't get to those next several steps without taking this one and the ones that I took two years ago to write some of these. So, yeah, I really think that we have to honor the, the younger works, the younger writing. And, and, and not even, you know... I mean, I can, I can snicker at it sometimes. I can scoff at it, you know, because it's the old me. And, and some, of these, some of these things I believe more deeply, more complexly, more nu nuanced. There's a lot more nuance to me than even three years ago. I've gone through an enormous amount of philosophical, theological shift in my life in the last few years. And man, it's not all in here, but like, I, I love some of the things that this guy wrote. And so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to honor that, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Have you ever taken any of your early works and felt like you wanted to rework them? Yeah, I always quote George Lucas here, uh, which he's thanked in here. He might not ever read that. But George, Duncan, George Lucas is thanked in here for mainly because he said when he did the, um, the kind of the like, the special effects remasters where he did the special edition remasters, I think in the nineties or early 2000s, late nineties, early two thousands, he said, I wanted to go back to my abandoned movie because he said most people, most works of art, most films, he said were abandoned, you know, and that there's a famous person before him that said that. And he said, I wanted to go finish my abandoned movies. And which for, for George Lucas to say that, it's like, uh, those aren't really abandoned. <laughs> those are pretty good, pretty good works of, you know, sci science fiction. Um, but I, yeah, I, I echo that. But at the same time, I don't go and change all of there. There are some that I think like, oh, I would really serve even that younger version by adding and um, polishing and shaping it a little bit different and maybe putting it in just a different format than what I had, you know, so there's a lot of little tweaks, but as far as the major tweaks go again, I'm going to honor, I'm going to honor that because I think that's really important. Um, but, uh, yeah, so for, for me, um, I, but it does feel like, I mean, I feel like in some ways this was abandoned, you know, at some point you just go, all right, I just got to get the thing out there. I'm not going to edit this like a 18th time we're just gonna you know I had like eight people read it maybe nine people and got lots of good feedback I changed quite a few things we did a lot of things with the formatting and at some point you just put it out there all art is vulnerable and every artist every writer every poet's going to find some little pieces of what they've done that they probably would change <laughs> but that's I think art is also vulnerability it's human and so I also like to highlight, there's uh, two errors in this that I've found. So if you find those, uh, I'll give you a button later. I spelled, uh, they're actually minor typos where I spelled 
proper names wrong, uh, given the person I was trying to thank, and I've already apologized profusely to those two people. Um, but uh, yeah, uh, I think for t tonight, I think I'd probably like to get off of the mic, and if you like to ask more questions, I'm going to be around for a little bit, but I'm going to have my books for sale. Um, I have a few pickups for some folks. Phil, I've got your stuff back there. I've got Cabin, i got your stuff, um, and a few others, Grace. And um, I have some things for sale. The books are $14. Um, and I've got, yeah, i got a few extra things back there, some typewriter some typer, typewriter work and stuff that I've done. But uh, feel free to stay around if you have any other questions or anything. I just appreciate you guys listening, and I hope I didn't bore you too bad tonight. Yeah. <laughs>